one of the questions I get most often from my clients is, how do I tell my clients that I'm raising my prices? This presupposes that we have already done all the work. We created like a really good pricing model. We've sort of measured the market. We've validated it with customers. We have uh, sales tested it with new customers so that we actually know that the pricing sort of is right for the market. Now we're actually doing the rollbacks. We're telling existing, let's say legacy customers that we're raising prices on them. So this is not the should we grandfather or not discussion. Let's just assume that you decided not to, and you're telling your customers that you're raising pricing. So how should you do it? I want to tell you a story. Last month, obviously not now, but last month I went to get my haircut. And um, I get my haircut at a family salon. So this is three generations of hairdressers working side by side. So it's a grandfather, his son, and the granddaughter. And um, and before them, actually, there were two generations uh, working there. So this is a fifth generation hair salon that's been going for a hundred years in Copenhagen where I live. And I'm getting my hair cut by the grandfather who is quite old. So he's in his mid seventies or so. And when I got there, he was just finishing up uh, with an old lady. So about his age, maybe a little older even. And you know, they were talking and chatting and so forth. And he, he's very sociable. So, so most hairdressers are, I guess. They obviously had known each other for a long time. And then when she was paying, she was like, okay, so how much is it? And he said, well, it's, the equivalent of five dollars and i was like huh i'm paying like 50 to get my hair cut and this is a lady and she had done like a lot of things so, i mean my hair's easier to cut than hers so she paid and then left with a smile and i could see when she walked out that she actually had a taxi waiting for her that had been waiting there the whole time so and i asked him about this and said you know why would she pay five dollars only and she says well you know She's actually been coming here since I was in my early 20s. So I've cut her hair for, I think, almost 60 years. So 55 years or something. And, you know, back then it was $5 to get like the full hairdo for women. I was like, but this is 55 years ago. And she says, yeah, you know, but, you know, I don't like raising the prices. So, and then I asked like, well, what are you charging a new customer that walks through? And he said, well, we're going to charge, let's say $60. So already I'm underpriced 10, right? And the lady is underpriced, I don't know way more and then he said yeah so so she lives on the other side of town because she moved at some point so and she's wealthy so 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 she will drive here uh, once a week in a taxi have the taxi wait for her for the hour it takes hour and a half it takes for me to cut her hair and do her hair and then she goes out and drives home and the taxi is you know 150 bucks in Copenhagen, something like that. It's, it's, it's ridiculous, right? So the haircut is like marginal expense compared to the transportation to go and get the haircut. And this is the best example I have of someone who just is unwilling to raise their prices. And he doesn't need it because they own the real estate that the salon is in and it's been in the family for generations and so forth. And, and they, you know, have a very solid business uh, otherwise, but Sometimes the relationships we have with customers get in the way of telling them also because we simply just don't know how to do it. We don't like the situation to tell someone that what you used to pay $5 for is now 10 and what you used to pay 10 for is now 15 and so forth so that we can upgrade them over time. And if you have your customers for a long time, 55 years, you are going to lose out on a lot of revenue. With SaaS companies, it's even worse, right? Because the haircut is the same. So essentially he cut his hair the same way 50 years ago. But if you're developing software, the software changes, the haircut gets better over time. So not only do you have the inflation of the time period, but you also have the value increase of the time period over time that you lose out on if you don't find the resource within yourself to tell the customers. So this is for some reason incredibly hard for a lot of companies and not only founder owned companies, but also actually corporates. And for a long time, I was, I was simply just annoyed with this. I would just say, well, just write them, just write them an email, say the price has gone up and you know, we, we tested everything. So yes, you might get a little churn, but averaged out, what we see is actually usually that the price increase just accelerates churn. So the churn that you would have gotten anyways in the next year or so <clears throat> just comes a little earlier. But overall, usually it's not a lot of churn. And actually what happens also is that the customers who do leave tends to be the ones that puts the most demand on your customer success and your support teams and so forth. Anyways, because they weren't the right fit to begin with. So each case is different, but often it isn't as scary as you think it's going to be. Regardless of all my you know, arguments and experiences and case stories and the validation we did and the new pricing that works in the market and so forth, it's still an issue. So 
I've just decided to come up with an approach for it, which I've used for a couple of years, which tends to work really well. And what I found out is that part of the pain is that there is a big moment of risk, or at least there is a big experience that we are risking something when we are sending the email with the price increase to all of our customers. And the you know doomsday scenarios in our thinking tends to turn around, okay, so I'm gonna lose all of my business like an hour after I send that email because I'm just gonna get flooded with churn emails and I'm gonna drown and sink and die. And this is of course not going to happen, but the feeling remains, which usually is the primary reason why people tend to grandfather. So what I suggest instead is that you slice the pain up. You make it into more bite-sized chunks so that you reduce the risk at any step. Because it occurred to me at some point that it says nowhere that you need to raise prices for all of your customers at the same time, right? So, and this is, for some reason, it's just like a primary assumption that, hey, if we're gonna raise prices for all our existing customers, we're you know gonna write all of them at the same time and raise prices. But, well, you decide that, right? So what I usually do actually now is that when I work with, with a client, I take a spreadsheet of all of their customers and what they're paying them today. So let's say you have the AR, MR in a column and you have all the customer's name, and then you sort that column from high to low so that you get the highest paying customer and then the next highest paying customer so far, all the way down to the lowest paying customer of them all. And then you sort that into, usually I tend to use four cohorts of equal revenue. So I call them ARR cohorts. So let's say that you have a million in AR across, let's just make this easy, a hundred customers. But usually what will happen is that unless you're, you have been very disciplined in your, and you have a, a one product only, they will not pay the same, right? So one customer will pay, the average ACV is 10,000. So one customer is likely going to pay something like 70,000, right? And then you have a long tail of customers only paying 8,000 or whatever your lowest value product is and so forth. So usually there's some sort of 80, 20 or power law distribution of revenue among your customers. And we see that, which means that if you take four equal revenue chunks, each chunk is gonna be $250,000 ARR. But in the first chunk, you might only have five customers. While in the last chunk, you might have 50, right? But from a revenue perspective, they are of an equal size. So you have four chunks of 250,000 each. And depending a little bit on how hard the power law distribution is, I usually say, well, the tier one customers, the ones that are 25% of the revenue and are only a very few customers, them you call, right? So don't risk that, just like pay them a visit. You know, you, maybe you have an opportunity, you call them up and ask for me and you tell them in person. And also because sometimes and oftentimes, these are the customers that you have more special relationships to. They're the ones who help drive your roadmap a little bit. They are the ones who are, you know, the, the big uh, logos on your website and so forth. So you wanna handhold them a little bit and you wanna tell them softly, but tell them straight up. Now, the other three chunks, you just write them one at a time. and. So there are two ways to do this. Either you just write the second largest customers and the third largest and the fourth largest. You can also do it in the reverse order or you scramble them and just write them in three equal bits. So, you know, a third of the ones from tier two, a third of the ones from tier three and a third of the ones from tier fourth. And then you just tell them. So you write the emails to the customers and you raise prices and then you spend two weeks and then you handle all the customer success work and support work and, and anti-churn prevention and so forth. But because you're only writing, uh, let's say a third of your customers or fourth of your customers, you're not gonna get blown back. And if you have some sort of a blow up in the pricing, they'll say uh, that you, something went wrong, right? You, your customers may be so legacy that the price increase is really going to increase churn. You're only going to risk a quarter of your revenue, right? So. You divide it into four chunks. One of the chunks you're, let's say, hand holding. And then you, one of the other chunks is only gonna be 250,000 ARR. So even if you have 40% churn on that, it's only gonna be 100,000, which is still a lot, but you are not at risk of losing the entire business. So if you make a mistake, you have time to fix it, right? Because you have the two other revenue chunks left on harm. So you might you know, redo your validation, 
You might do other things in order to make sure that this is the right move before you execute on the other cohorts. So really what it does is it tranches the risk that you're facing when you're doing these uh, pricing rollovers, rollbacks as they usually call them, which makes it much more bearable for startups and, and uh, let's say legacy tech companies that, that have a mature business because the AR at risk is so much lower when you do it in, in a chunky fashion instead of just doing it wholesale in one big blast. So that is the method of doing it that I really found that reduces risk and just anxiety and also actually makes the process easier to handle from a customer success perspective. Now, the last thing I wanna cover is what to actually write an email. So, and here's the mistake everybody makes. So first is that usually everybody makes these emails too long and about the wrong thing. Very simply, you should just try to be clear in your communication rather than try to sort of sugarcoat that you're raising prices. Like you're raising prices, it's not a big deal. Probably you deserve to raise prices, right? If you've already tested it and validated it in the market, you can raise prices. You just need to tell them. So, right, we're raising prices by this much or this method, depending if you're making a change in the model, you should let them know. And we're doing it by this time. So it will affect you on your March billing or whatever. Then you tell them we are doing it because as you know, we have a mission to provide you with X solution, solving X for you. And back in the day, we did it this way. But in the meantime, we have produced this roadmap for you. So the solution got better. So you do a past review of product improvements that have come recently and that you know that customers generally have liked. And then you say, we are also doing it to keep improving the product such as, and then you do a future review of the roadmap that is incoming saying, we are going to build X, Y, and C for you in the future to make it even better. So you take this sort of point in time on where are we now, we're updating you to this and we're doing it because we already delivered a lot of extra value to you. And we are going to keep doing this by delivering more value to you. This also serves the purpose of getting the customer used to getting price increase, right? And what this does as your solution is growing also from a product perspective, it might be so that the customer actually needs to rechoose their product configuration. So maybe they're on a wrong tier or they need to offload some of the modules that they're buying, or they need to onload some of the things they're buying. And this is where the third part comes in. And what I meant when I said, most people talk about the wrong thing, because what most people miss is that everybody will read the price increase email. So this is a perfect place to sell, right? So if you have done a product configuration, which often is the occasion in which you would raise prices, you have a perfect opportunity to sell that new product configuration, the new tier of the new module to your customers saying, hey, we've done some repackaging. You know, you used to be in the basic tier. We're now calling it the easy tier, whatever. But you should know that we built a new advanced tier, which you know delivers this awesome value and automates all these things or produces these outcomes. So if you want to take a look at that or you know, book us for a demo, we'd be happy to reach out or we will reach out to you, whatever your sales process is like. But using the price increase email to communicate about value and also communicate about the value that they're missing out on in the rest of your product is a great opportunity. And this is especially true if you just build higher ticket items, right? So maybe everybody was on the, let's say, low price tier, and now you build new functionality. And really what you're doing is you want to increase the pricing on the low tier because that also got better, but you also want to sell some of the new tiers. So you also want to use it to migrate people up to the increased value or better value proposition that you have. And so I've seen this work time and time again. And this actually sort of also makes the cohort approach better because now you get a little bit of split testing, right? So you can roll the stuff out to cohort one with, and you can, you can even split test that email, right? So we had write two versions of it, but you roll, you blast it out to number one. And now your customer success team is handling all the churn and maybe also some of the upgrades and your account executives are actually handling some of the upgrades reaching out to customers and say, hey, you know, we just increased prices. Did you notice that we also have a, like a new product launch? You know, you want to upgrade to that. Maybe I can give you a good deal on it whatever it is, and then you use the price increase to actually sell more instead of just, you know, getting hit by the churn and standing there like a victim of your, you know, own value in the product. So these are sort of the 
this is the key method that that I've found just just works. And it works because it does these two things. It reduces the emotional stress around raising prices because it reduces the actual risk of doing so. Because even if the, you know, the the black swan event happens that you you totally miss something and you're going to get like massive churn on the price increase. You only do it on a quarter of the customers, which is much easier to handle, right? So that means that suddenly the opportunity cost, like if it's going to work, we can increase prices for everyone. If it's not going to work, we're only going to lose out on a small proportion of customers. So you have, you're creating this asymmetrical risk reward scenario within your own legacy cohort by chunking it out like this. And also you're using the opportunity to upsell all of the new existing, or, or let's say the new uh, value that you have in your product if you're raising or changing pricing as part of a, a product launch or packaging relaunch. So I just wanted to share that with you. I know that not just because of inflation, but also just because of you know the need to actually monetize customers better. A lot of you are raising prices around New Year's. So this is just a tip on how to write that email and essentially write the, the three or four emails that you that you need to write. So I hope this was helpful and um, you know, take care of them.